so we'll get started. We'll, um, Darren is here with me today, so we'll be um, sharing a lot of information. Darren is a migration agent with Visa Go Australia. Um, all certified, got all the right um, accreditations and certifications. Um, and you can visit their, um, their website. It's just easy, Visa Go Australia. And uh, they're on Twitter and Facebook if you want to follow up as well. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, so I'm a registered migration agent. I'm currently working in the uh, office in Western Australia. We also have an office in Edinburgh in Scotland. And Sue, one of our senior case processors, works uh, out of uh, London uh, remotely. So we've got you sort of covered in the UK and Australia. And we've been doing this for about 20 years. And our specialisation is skilled visas, family and temporary employee sponsored. So at any time, feel free just to uh, ask any questions about it, any visas or processing on skilled visas, et cetera, and more than happy to uh, answer them for you. Yep, fantastic. Um, and currently I'm supporting um, teachers that are coming from the UK to Australia with um, all the different questions about teaching registrations, um, working with ANZ UK and things like that. So um, exciting update with the Australian border. Um, we're almost at 90% of um, over 18 year, uh, sorry, over 16 year olds double vaccinated. I think that we'll hit that tomorrow. Um, and we've got a good booster program in place. So Australia is feeling confident about reopening the borders, which happened yesterday. Um, so working holiday visa holders are now able to enter the country. Um, and that's without a travel exemption as well. Yeah, so there's been quite a few temporary visas um, that have been given an exemption for travel. So the working holiday, the 417 is, is a great one for those under 31 from the UK. And for those in Ireland, um, you can apply up to the age of 35. Uh, also the 482 employee sponsored visa um, you can now enter australia without an exemption on that one as well um, and there's quite a few other student visas uh, prospective marriage visas so it's all good news for those temporary visa holders to get a foot into australia fantastic so um the preference is that you are fully vaccinated <laughs> Um, and definitely, definitely when you're working in, in schools in Australia, um, it is a requirement to be fully vaccinated unless you have a valid um, reason why you can't be. So the vaccines that are approved or recognised by Australian, Australia's Therapeutic Goods Administration are the AstraZeneca Vaxivera, uh, AstraZeneca Covishield, Pfizer or BioNTech camaraderie or how you say it <laughs> that's the one I got but I don't know how to say it um, Moderna spike vax or Takeda and the Barrett biotech covaxin and Sinopharm BBIBP Corv uh, for only 18 to 6 year olds or if you've had one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine by Janssen um, that's fine as well well, I didn't realise there was that many different COVID vaccines. A lot, isn't there's it? a lot. There's a lot. Um, yeah. That list has expanded too, which is great news um, for yeah. people who went on the initial list. And there might be some more that um, are added to that in the future as well. So do keep an eye on the, the um, you know, what the TGA are approving. When you are preparing to fly to Australia, there are some requirements um, regarding that. Um, so the first one. Well, the, the main thing is to complete an Australian travel declaration, which involves uploading your vaccine certificate, making a legally binding declaration regarding your vaccination status, providing the last 14 days of your travel history so they can see where you've been um, and if you've been into any of the hotspot areas. Um, acknowledge that when you check in, you'll need to provide a negative PCR test that's been taken within three days of flying and then also declaring that you'll comply with any relevant quarantine requirements. And then regarding quarantine, um, we had a very brief window where it was looking like there would be no quarantining, but given the recent um, variant, we now are seeing um, a minimal requirement for fully vaccinated travellers. So you do need to check the requirement for the particular state or territory that you're arriving to. Um, and if you choose to travel interstate, there may be additional requirements to look at. So make sure you're keeping aware of everything that's going on and everything that's current. Um, the current Victorian requirements, just to give an example, are to require with, uh, comply with all the Commonwealth entry requirements. So the 
um, what we just went through. Quarantining for 72 hours after arriving. You can self-quarantine if you're fully vaccinated. If you're partially or unvaccinated, you'll need to quarantine for 14 days in a hotel. You're required to get a PCR test within 24 hours of arriving and then an additional PCR test between days seven, five and seven after arrival. Um, and there are some restrictions around um, uh, high risk um, places such as going to schools. You're not to um, go to a school within seven days of arrival, which might, might need to be factored in um, if you're planning on teaching straight away. Okay, so I mean, the good news uh, for everyone overseas is that the Australian government, um, as of today, uh, is allowing a lot of the temporary visa holders in uh, and also permanent resident visa holders. So, for example, as you can see up there, a permanent resident holder would be a skilled independent 189 or a state sponsored 190. Uh, the temporary visa holders would be the work and holiday 417 or the employee sponsored 482. So if you're a holder of any of those visas, uh, you don't have to go through the old system where you get the visa, then you apply for a travel exemption. Uh, you just automatically have that exemption to be able to enter Australia on that particular visa. Uh, things like tourist visas are not included on that list. So we're getting a lot of those questions of, from people saying, oh, Australia's open, I can go in on a three month tourist visa. Uh, for a holiday. No, it's only certain temporary uh, visa holders that can enter and permanent residents and Australian citizens. Um, and if you've got a exemption, but trying to get an exemption is very difficult. The only ones we're seeing at the moment is, for example, say you're a partner of an Australian citizen or a permanent. So if you've been living with your Aussie partner for more than a year or married, you can get an exemption. Um, and we're also seeing parents is another one as well. So uh, if you're in Australia as a permanent resident, your parents can come out to Australia uh, and visit on that visa as well. So really just check the Australian government website. There's probably, I think last time I counted about 28 different visas, um, but primarily the ones that uh, you see on the list there are the ones that will be affecting most people here today. Fantastic. Um, so when you are um, registering with uh, for, for teaching, um, so there are some visas that uh, require a skills assessment um, by AITSL, and they may um, some visas may also require you to register for um, your occupation, so teaching, and your registration will actually require your visa, so you can get it. Um, which is a bit of a catch-22 situation. The authorities are aware of that. Um, so you just need to contact the teaching authority regarding your situation in that case. Um, and each state and territory does have their own teaching authority. Um, we can delve into that further um, in um, other time, but um, that's something to be aware of. And then early childhood educators do need to have an additional assessment through a CEQA. So there's a few little hoops to jump through sometimes, depending on the visa you're going for. To be recognised as a teacher in Australia, you do need to have either a four-year Bachelor of Education or a three-year Bachelor and a PGCE, or a three-year Bachelor and a Master of Teaching. If you don't have one of these qualifications, there are a couple of options available to you. Um, if you're looking to come long-term, the best thing to do is a PGCE top-up. Um, Otherwise, you might, if you're coming short term, you might be able to um, go through the New Zealand route, which is to register with the New Zealand um, Teaching Council and then um, apply for your registration with the relevant Australian authority. And then you can apply via mutual recognition, um, which means that you get like for like registration. Uh, Again, that's um, something we can delve into further on. It is a more expensive um, pathway, but if you've got a three-year Bachelor of Education, that's something that you can look into doing. All right, back to Darren to give us a bit of an example of skilled points, what that means. 
Okay, so um, if you're a teacher overseas and you're looking uh, to make the move permanently to Australia, um, the most popular skilled visas are the 189, uh, the 190 and the 491, and they're all points based. So basically, the best idea is to just maybe go onto our website, we offer a free uh, assessment, uh, you type in all your details, and we will email back you your points so you can confirm that you are eligible to apply for the visa. Um, so what I've done here, I'll just put up an example of a 34 year old uh, single secondary school teacher, UK passport holder with a bachelor, three year bachelor degree and a PGCE. So as we can see here for the age, um, this individual will be getting 25 points uh, for the qualification 15. Now, being a UK passport holder, you don't necessarily have to do the English exam, but it means you would only get zero points. So. 95% of our clients uh, migrating to Australia do the English exam purely because it's about getting more points. So the most popular one is IELTS um, and it's writing, reading, listening and speaking. There's four areas that you're actually tested in and the test goes for approximately about three and a half hours. Now this person uh, has set the test and has got eight out of nine in all four areas. So that means that we can claim 20 points for English now, if this person got 8, 9, 9, and 7.5 and had an overall score of 8, we couldn't class the, we couldn't claim the 20 points for English. You have to have 8 in all four areas. So that's quite important. So one of the first stages of the process of a skilled visa is possibly get your English uh, language test done and try and get the 20 points if you have, then it'd be good then to move on uh, because it's roughly around about 370, 380 Australian dollars. The next one is this person here, since uh, qualifying with the PGC, has worked full time uh, for five years in the past 10. So that would equate to 10 points for work experience. And this individual is single. So that means the person hasn't got a partner and that gives them a bonus of 10. So if you add all that up, that gives them 80 points for a 189, which is a skilled independent visa. Independent because it means that you don't require sponsorship from an employer or a state government. Uh, this is a five year permanent residency visa, which is basically the best visa because it allows you to live and work anywhere in Australia. And once you've been in Australia for four years, you can then apply to be an Australian citizen. Now with 80 points, if you look at the Australian government website, um, every three months, the Australian government goes in and looks at all the expressions of interests and under the 189, they issue invites. Now, the last invite was back in October and they only invited 200 applicants worldwide and the minimum point score was 90 points. So as you can see, this person here on 80 points could be waiting a while to receive an invite. So. We often say to people, look, you need to probably look at the 190, which is, it is still a five-year permanent residency visa. All you need to do is try and obtain state sponsorship. So if you're looking to go to New South Wales, um, you could have a look at the New South Wales State Government website and a secondary school teacher is on that list and you meet their criteria, you can apply to them and get state sponsorship and it gives you a bonus of five points. The best thing about the state sponsorship is that it's not capped. So what that means is every three months when the Australian government look at the expressions of interest and invite people, the state government can invite you at any stage. So 85 points is quite high and the likelihood of you getting state sponsorship is quite good, which is why we recommend looking at state sponsorship. Um, just on the flip side though, um, with COVID at the moment, um, a lot of the state governments um, are looking for applicants to be in Australia to obtain state sponsorship. So the good news is those under 31 or 35 in the island, you can get your working holiday visa, have a chat to Carmel, she can organise some work for you in Australia. You can zip out to Australia and then once you're in Australia, then you can look to be state sponsored and then apply for the 190 visa. So that's sort of a, a stepping stone way of getting into Australia and getting the state sponsorship. Fantastic. Um, and what is an expression of interest? Okay, so an expression of interest is for those people looking for a skilled visa. 
Um, you can also lodge an expression of interest uh, for the permanent um, or business visas. Um, but let's talk for, with the, the skilled worker. So basically, you have to do, make sure you get your points sorted. So you can go on and do a free assessment, make sure you're eligible. Um, what we suggest is you do your English test, you do your skills assessment, um, and then you can actually go on to Skill Select, um, which is the Australian Government website which is homeaffairs.gov.au. And you can go on there and lodge what's called an expression of interest. Now these expressions of interest are valid for two years. And during that period, the Australian government, if it's a 189 or a 491 family sponsored, every three months go in and have a look at all the people in that expression of interest and see what sort of point score you have. Um, and as we know, if you've got 90 or more, then they will look at the, the amount of people that they want to sponsor um, and issue you an invite. What you can also do is when you lodge an expression of interest, you've got the choice to tick a 189, a 190 or a 491. So you can also go in there and tick boxes and, and choose the state governments that you want to go to. So for example, if you're a secondary school teacher, you can get your expression of interest ready, your skills assessment, English language references, lodge it for a 189. And if you're on 80 points, you know that you probably won't get an invite. But what you could do is say, I want to go to Queensland and you can tick the 190 Queensland box and the 491 Queensland box. So then the Queensland government can actually see that you've expressed and have an expression of interest in and looking to go to Queensland. And if they like what they see and you have the points and tick meet their criteria, then they can give you an invite as well. And then you can get an invite, um, apply, and then if your invitation is accepted by Queensland, they let the Australian government know, and then you get invited to apply for your visa. So essentially expression of interest is basically what it says, you're expressing your interest to migrate to Australia under a skilled visa category. Fantastic. Um, and the costs involved in that, or the application yeah. process once you're invited. Yeah, all right. So let's say you're lucky, um, you've got 95 points, you do a 189, um, the Australian government invites you. And the thing is an expression of interest, uh, I forgot to say, it's not an actual visa application. So it's free to lodge an expression of interest and you sit in the pool for two years. Once the Australian government invites you or a state government, that's when you start the process. And when you apply for the visa, these are, these are the fees that are applicable. So starting off, um, if you're a secondary school teacher, primary, early years, child, um, you have to be assessed by AITSL and their skill assessment is $1,000.50. So what they'll be doing is they'll be checking your qualifications. Usually you'd have a, a three-year degree or a PGCE or a Bachelor of Education four years. Um, then you'd have to do your English language test uh, to get those bonus points. Um, and when you lodge the visa of the Australian government, the main applicant is 415, sorry, 4,115 if you've got a partner included in your application. Now, a partner can be included in your application if you're married or if you've got de facto evidence for more than 12 months of living together. And that's not, you know, just emails and photos, that's joint bank accounts, joint rental agreements, joint council tax, et cetera. And if you have a child under 18 years of age, you can also include the children in the application. Once the application is lodged, um, the Australian government will check out all the details on the application. And if everything looks fine, then they'll ask you to do your medicals and your criminals. So as you can see there, per adult, roughly around $700. Um, and any child under 12 is probably about half that because they don't have to do a chest X-ray. And any country that you've lived in for longer than a year, you have to provide a police clearance. And uh, Australian or UK ones roughly around about $95. Um, if you are going to apply for a state-sponsored visa, the various states have different fees. Some states uh, charge $200 to process a state sponsorship application, right up to around $750. So that just gives you a quick overview of what a, a skilled visa would generally cost. Great. Um, and so the ATSL and the IELTS would happen for putting together your expression of interest. And then the next steps would be um, paying the visa fee and medical and that sort of thing, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm of the opinion that you should always get your application ready and, and have everything assessed. Um, we get a lot of people um, contact us and say, oh, I've lost my expression of interest. And I say, oh, so how'd you go in the IELTS English exam? They go, oh, I haven't done it yet. I said, uh, well, mm. what points have you claimed? Um, I said, oh, I've claimed 10. Well, okay, but when you get invited, you've got uh, 60 days to lodge it. Now, what happens if you can't get your exam booked in and the results back? Or worst case scenario, what happens if you do really badly in the exam, you don't get the points, then you've lost that opportunity for that invitation. Um, mm. So you need to have everything, all the box ticked. So your skills assessment, English language, get all your references. If you're claiming five years work experience, have your five years of, of references, your P60s, your tax returns, your pay slips, have it all ready so you're ready to go. So once you get invited, you've got all the documentation ready there in front of you. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so for primary school teachers, what skilled visas would you recommend applying for? Or can they apply? Yeah, for? I've put this one in because we, we often get a lot of primary school teachers say, oh, I want to apply for the 189 independent or my uncle living in a regional area in, in Western Australia wants to sponsor me. Well, with the primary school teacher, it's on the STSOL. It's not on the main um, list, which means they have to be sponsored. So the 189 and the 491 family sponsored is off the table. So if you're a primary school teacher, you have to look at the state sponsorship lists and to go through the state sponsorship visa category for the skilled. Or you can still be employee sponsored or, or get a working holiday visa and uh, zip on out to Australia and, and get a job and maybe get sponsorship that way. Um, the other thing, too, is you, if you can come out on a working holiday visa um, and get a job for Ange UK, if you work for 12 months in Australia, um, you can get bonus points for work experience as well. So um, you may want to think about that if you're a few points short, is, is building up your work experience in Australia. Yeah, that's great. And can you be sponsored by a school? There's sort of two parts to this question, but Darren, I'll throw to you first. Okay. Well, how do you find it, Carmel? Are you finding many um, schools or employers looking to sponsor teachers in Australia at the moment? Um, yeah, so there, it's an interesting question. We do have schools that are looking for um, specific um, uh, experience or expertise in different areas that are looking are open to sponsorship um, to find the right person because on the ground that it's been it's been difficult for them um, but it cannot it's generally challenging for a school to be able to sponsor um, mm. but it we we do find that um, there are schools that are open to it and um, aren't daunted by that process <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just a bit of um, education on on the on the company or the uh, the employer. I mean, which is why I'm over in in, in Australia at the moment, just trying to educate people because it's not as hard and difficult as a lot of companies think. But yeah. there are a few barriers, and and obviously one of them is advertising the position for the 28 days. Um, you've got to put it on uh, Job Active site. You also need to put it on Seek or Indeed or another reputable um, advertising agency and, and have that running and then show the Australian government why you can't employ an Australian citizen. So obviously some companies aren't, aren't keen on doing that, but there are some out there and the 482 is an option. Um, for those people also already in Australia on a 417 working holiday visa, um, that's a strong possibility to pick up sponsorship because obviously if you've been doing a bit of work as a teacher, you've got your registration, say in Victoria, um, you're all ready to go really, you just need that, uh, you just need that employer to sponsor you and, and it's a good stepping stone visa, it keeps you in Australia, builds your work experience points, um, more opportunities uh, open up when you're in Australia. So yeah. So yeah, definitely uh, there are some employers out there looking to sponsor teachers. Yep, fantastic. And um, some of the specific um, specialisations that are fairly in demand are things like special educational needs and early childhood. We do experience um, a high demand for EC teachers and ACN teachers. Um, visa eligibility for these roles is similar to that 
of um, a secondary teacher. Um, so primary is just the, that exception um, where they're on the, the short term um, list rather than being on the main list. Um, and while sponsorship can be an option, having Australian experience is generally necessary for an early childhood teacher and it's advantageous for other teachers as well. Although it can be worth trying to find someone to sponsor you if you're not eligible for the 417 visa, that working holiday visa. Um, we can always discuss with you um, your situation and, and see if there are schools that are interested in um, sponsoring, but um, it's just a more of a long shot um, if you don't have Australian experience. So applying for a skilled worker visa, can you do it right now? Definitely. So if you're sitting there and you've made your mind up, you want to come to Australia, um, I say to people, look, why wouldn't you get the process happening? Um, you know, get your English test done, your skills assessment done, look at your state sponsorship, because a lot of states aren't sponsoring overseas applicants at the moment, but around the corner they will be. Uh, it usually takes someone three or four months to get uh, an expression of interest to the stage where they're ready to lodge it, um, get a skills assessment done, English test. So why not spend the next three to six months, get your application ready, put your expression of interest in the system, and then if you're in the system, the state governments, when they open, can go, hey, John's a secondary school teacher in Mass. We need him. He's got five years' experience. Let's sponsor him. So boom, you get a uh, an email saying, hey, John, we want to sponsor you to Queensland. Do you want to come? Oh, yes, I do. And then off you go. And it's all about getting in the system um, and making yourself available and seen. And, and I, you know, I say, if, if you are looking to come to Australia, then why not get started? Um, or even look at the 4, 417 working holiday, get out there um, and get into it. So, yeah, I'd be getting started if, if you've made your mind up, most definitely. Great. And Darren, do you think there'll be, um, with the, the 189, do you think the Australian, the Australian government will start to consider those with less than 90 points in future again? Um, probably not. Not Probably not for another six to 12 months. Yep. Um, because in the last six months, the Australian government have only invited... Uh, for the 189, 400 people in six mm -hmm. months in the whole world um, at above 90 points. And I don't know the exact numbers, but last time I looked at them, I think there was something like 120,000 applications in the system for 189. Yeah. So I would say a large percentage of those would be over 90. So I don't think we're gonna to get to a level um, where it drops below 90 in the near future. Um, I may be wrong, but I, I would say at least probably a year, maybe two years, um, which is why your state sponsorship is sort of a stronger option than a 189 um, yep. in the near future anyway. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. And what is the outlook for skilled migration for 2022? It's all positive. <laughs> um, I think it's really good. I mean, it's good news for me because um, I can start processing some visas now, um, especially on the temporary side. Um, we're going to see a lot of people coming to Australia and working holiday visas. The employee-sponsored visas have now opened up. Um, the temporary skilled visas have opened up. Um, and uh, I'm in Western Australia. I mean, we don't let anyone in here at the moment, but uh, <laughs> Mark McGowan is letting people come in from the 5th of February. So I think the pressure is on Western Australia and other states like New South Wales are accepting people now. So look, I, I think it's all positive. I'd say early next year, we'll see that um, a lot more restrictions will be lowered. Um, so yeah, for me, it's positive. Um, and if you want to come to Australia, I'd say early next year, the majority of states uh, will be open um, and welcoming you uh, with open arms. Yep, definitely good times here in Australia. <laughs> I think so. And I think there's lots of work too. I mean, mm, uh, there is. Uh, I, I just look at gum tree ads and the papers, and I, you know, go out for dinner and just. Ads on windows, chefs and cooks, waiters, professionals, you know, um, yep. 
every yeah. occupation there's huge shortages so definitely don't be don't be frightened of coming over and, and being unemployed i don't think <laughs> that's gonna happen um yeah so it, it's yeah. a great time to be here um and i don't know what it's like uh uh over where you are in victoria i mean you've been locked down for a fair bit but in wa i've been here for four, 13 months now and i've been locked down for three days Otherwise, everything has just been normal. So yeah. my daughter's in Scotland, in Edinburgh, and she's just going, Dad, I want to come to Australia. Um, <laughs> because they've been locked down nearly for a year or so now, and it looks like mm. they're going to go locked down for Christmas again. So it's a great time to get out to Australia. And, and now it's open, yeah. Yeah, it certainly good. is. Now, yeah. we've, we've forgotten all about lockdown in Victoria. Well, I haven't. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, no, you've copped it over there. <laughs> sorry for it. Yeah. So, uh, bounce back. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, it's all good. It's all on the up. So it's all positive. So, yeah, it's a great right. time to, uh, to be thinking of heading out here in the new yeah, year. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, there's really fantastic opportunities for teachers. And as you've been talking about, Darren, um, for other occupations as well. So any any teachers out there that are thinking of bringing a partner or some friends, um, there'll be work for them, whatever their occupation is. So come along. Yeah, without a doubt. There's, there's plenty of work for everyone. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, Fiona, any advice for TAFE or uni lecturers? That's slightly outside of our sphere of, um, of knowledge. Um, so well, I... These are wise, possibly. Um, depends on the qualifications and the work experience. Obviously, Carmel, you, you probably can't place them. Um, that's right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, was that from Fiona, was it? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so Fiona, if you want to go into our website and do an online assessment, um, and send your CV through to me. I can check out what visa applications are applicable to you. I mean, if you're under 31, you can come out on a working holiday visa, look for an employer to sponsor you, um, or I can look at the list and depending on your quals, see if we can get you a skills assessment and then look at the state sponsorship options. Because I think both of those aren't on the main list, so you may need state sponsorship. So yeah, just do that, send your CV through, do an assessment and we can advise you on the visa side of things. Mm, great. I think I was speaking to someone that um, had identified Tasmania as somewhere that was sponsoring uni lecturers or something like that, which is oh, okay. interesting. Yeah. So yeah. That is, there probably will be um, some options out there. Um, great. So if anyone had a working holiday visa that was affected due to COVID-19, um, from the 1st of July to the 31st of December, next year, holders and former holders of a COVID-19 affected working holiday visa are able to make a fee-free or the VAC application um, online, whether they're offshore and unable to, or if you're offshore and unable to come, or if you had to leave early, um, you can do that reapplication. Yeah, so basically you get your money back and, and, and apply yes. again and, and head on out here. So that's all good news. Yeah, you haven't lost your money, so that's quite... Yeah. <laughs> that's the, the simpler way to put it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Yeah. I was stumbling through that one there. <laughs> um, and so exciting news ahead of us. What does the new UK tourist and Australian trade deal mean for working holiday maker visas? We'll be, we have been getting heaps of people from the UK who are 31 and 32 and 33 going, yeah, it's now 35. Well, it may do in the future. Uh, I mean, obviously, Australia is negotiating with quite a few different countries to raise it to 35. Um, the main reason was trying to get people into Australia to fill the, the huge shortages of work. Um, but it has to be reciprocal. So I don't think, for example, the UK was too keen once they'd shaken hands with Scott Morrison um, and, uh, and Boris, once they thought about it a bit later, especially with everything opening up and that now, um, it's got to go through parliament and become law. So these sorts of things can take two or three years. So look, I wouldn't be uh, hanging my hat on if you're 33 uh, on Australia increasing it to 35 for UK passport holders, for example, I'd probably be looking at trying getting your state sponsorship or your employee sponsorship because that would come through a lot quicker. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so there have been rumours that it could be in place July 
2022. Is that something you're sceptical on? Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it, it could do, but look, from what I'm seeing, I just don't think there's an appetite for, for both countries to open up beforehand. Um, I may be wrong. Um, I suppose it depends on if there's another variant of the virus that comes through. There's, there's a lot, there's, there's too many things uh, at the moment, I think, which are uncertain. Um, so July 22, I think you'd be very hopeful. I would say probably another year, year and a half after that. All right. So that's the optimistic estimate, but don't, yeah. don't it count on it. Too then, much. It's a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and the other part to the new, um, what's been outlined for this agreement is that it will be a three year visa with no regional work requirement. Has there been any changes on that from what you've heard or? No, I think that's still in the pipeline. I mean, the, the nitty gritty of it all is on the Australian government website, so you can check that out. But mm. yeah, I haven't seen um, any changes to it or I haven't seen any movement on it either. Um, but if it does come through, it means, yeah, it's, it's a better system than the existing one where after 12 months, you have to have done your three months regional, you've got to send your pay slips in, prove it, apply for the second one. And then after the second one, you've got to do a similar one for your third year. So if they did streamline it and put that in place, that would be fantastic for those people who are eligible. Mm. Um, but like I said, I haven't seen any movement or any talk about that. I mean, it was pretty hot about four or five months ago, um, but it seems to have gone a bit quiet, which is why I'm a little bit, you know, optimistic. Okay. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and that question, will the borders be open to tourists anytime soon? Uh, well, look. Um, maybe towards the end of the year, I would say. Um, once again, if we had no more variants um, of, of the virus of COVID coming out, then, yeah, I'd say strong possibilities towards the end of the year because the tourism industry has been hit very hard. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, have, businesses have closed down. Um, people have been laid off in that particular industry. So mm. they need a kickstart. Um, but with the temporary visas coming in, that, that'll help um, for sure. Mm. But the tourist visas, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I think the big thing is places or states like Western Australia who are still demanding um, some people to do the quarantining, it's a little bit prohibitive. So once Australia decides that it's safe and they take down the, the mandatory, you know, 72 hours or 14 days mandatory um, quarantine, which is quite expensive because that's what I had to do, which was two and a half thousand mm. Australian dollars. Um, yeah. If you're coming over here for four weeks and you've got to spend two weeks in quarantine and pay two and a half grand, it's not very uh, attractive. So once yeah, that all right. goes and clears up, then I think, yeah, um, tourists uh, will be allowed to come in very shortly. Hmm. All right. And um, Carmilla and Fiona, anything we haven't covered that you'd like to ask about? Would that pop up in the, the chat, Carmel? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah um, okay. they can pop them in the chat yep. or unmute and ask if you're feeling keen. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, um, I'll come with questions. I've always got questions. Oh, fantastic. Um, Thanks, Fiona. <laughs> so um, I, I've got a cousin on uh, who, who lives in Perth who wants me to come and live with her there. I'm also interested in South Australia. Um, and I think what I would be most likely to get a job in um, is the TAFE lecturer for community services because I've got 20 years experience teaching very similar quals over here um, but the chances of actually getting a visa and getting everything sorted it's a bit mind-boggling um, so I'm almost finished on a PhD which will put me into the university lecturing but then I'm thinking about retraining to be a counsellor just to get in because there are more counselling jobs available um, so I'm just wondering, which jobs do you think are, I, I will do any job <laughs> as long as I can just come to Australia. 
Um, what jobs are getting filled with um, overseas workers, do you think, more often? Like what's, what's in demand over there the most in my sort of field or teaching anything? Mm. Well, one thing to consider, Fiona, is with the um, with your visa expression of interest, if you're um, putting, if you've got experience in a field, that's where you'll get the most points. But you, once you've um, got your visa, you don't actually have to work in that field. So if you're worried about not being employed in that, um, yeah, it's not not something you need to think about too much before you arrive. Okay. It's just a matter of getting in your putting your best foot forward I guess okay I score I definitely scored the most points as a TAFE lecturer how um, old are you Fiona if you don't mind me asking sorry how old are you if you don't mind me asking I'm getting on now I'm in a rush I'm 42 oh okay I haven't got long yeah so retraining is an issue because the cutoff age is 45 yeah um and as Colonel's already said you, if you've already got 10 years experience in one occupation that's giving you 15 bonus points so to yeah. retrain it means you're going to take off 15 points yeah and some state governments will only sponsor people with two to three years because if you're at that age you're going to need state sponsorship to get an invite mm. so you really got to stay with what you've got now and probably look at getting that expression of interest in sooner rather than later um yeah you just got to really look at um, I can't of I can't get into the system at the moment, but if you check out um, the lists and see what those two occupations are on, if they're on the uh, the main list, if you've got a first cousin living in Perth, that's a regional area. So you could probably look at a four nine one. Now the points for a four nine one uh, drop down to eighty. Um, so that may be a good option for you if you can get a skills assessment as a university lecturer and if it's on the main list. If it's on the secondary list, then obviously your first cousin can't sponsor you. Um, and my experience is South Australia is a very good state to go to because their sponsorship list is one of the longest in Australia. So you've got more chance of going to South Australia state sponsored than probably any other state. Yeah. Well, except maybe Tasmania, <laughs> as Carl said. But yeah. But look, once again, like I said, send your CV through to me. Uh, we can do a points check on you and, and give you some options. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that. I will do. Um, no problem. Shall I just find your email on the on your website? Yeah, just send it through to info. Um, that usually comes through to me. But if you go on and do okay. the free, free online assessment, do that as well. And then I've got your age and your work experience so I can do your points. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. No worries. It's Carmel's, is that Carmel? Um, yeah, Carmel had um, just some oh, more. Oh, there's, oh, I saw there's a second question come through. Um, uh, what can you do with ANZ UK in Australia? Um, right, okay. So yeah, um, Carmel, it will, oh, Carmel, it will depend on no, what sorry. your qualification is, um, whether you can apply to New Zealand. Um, but um, yeah, the uh, morning. Sorry, I was ah, getting ready. Okay. I have to go to work soon. Oh, no um, so I have a degree in philosophy. It's an Italian degree, and then I have a degree, a master's degree in logic and history of science, which was a bit of a mixture between physics, philosophy, and biology. Yeah. Um, but then I had. I took a license to teach in Italy, which is not a qualification, it's mm. kind of a license to be able to do the Italian exam, which allows you to teach. So it, it's kind of like I can be a supply in Italy, a level. Um, and here now I'm working as a math supply teacher. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you'll need to do it um, an education degree to be able to teach in, a, in Australia or New Zealand. Um, so the PGC being a year is, from what I understand, is the best option um, for you. Um, but otherwise, you would only be able to work as a teaching assistant through us, um, which is quite quite a different role um, to a teacher. And we don't have um, we don't have 
unqualified teachers or cover supervisors here in Australia. It's either you're a teacher or you're a teaching assistant. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for the teaching assistant, because they told me that I've been a teaching assistant when I started with NCUK, so mm. it's fine. I like I like it. Okay. Um, but they told me that I need a license or a kind of a qualification even for that. Do I? Here in Australia, you don't. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. So, Perfect. Yeah, there there is a qualification that you can do. Um, but you don't actually need it. It's just, oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> it's more of a nice to have. Um, but if you've got any, any kind of experience that trumps even having that. So um, yeah, you could, you could definitely come and work as a, a teaching assistant if you're happy with that role and, um, and the pay it's uh, in here in Victoria, it's 29.95 per hour for that one. Um, and yeah, you, you, could, you could do that role very easily. Okay, nice. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm going to send you an email in any case, Camille, if yeah, you don't mind. So definitely. To we explain can you better. Yep. And yeah, my idea yep. would be to uh, try and come with a work. Uh, I am 29. So um, mm. my idea is coming like after I turn 30. Yep. So in September 2022. Mm. Um, so I could just apply for a normal working visa. Do I need the points as well? No, no. Um, working holiday visa is very straightforward, um, and they're okay. they're um getting they seems processing's almost back to normal. I heard of one person the other day who got theirs back pretty much immediately, which Instantly. is what we're used to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, very straightforward application. Um, you can uh, you just need to have um five thousand dollars Australian in the bank, um, and then the application fee is four hundred ninety five dollars. Okay. Yep. And just apply before you turn 31. <laughs> yep, that's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Keep your age in mind as well. <laughs> yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But just, just, okay. with my visa, just with my visa hat on, um, Camilla, if you're going out as a teaching assistant, um, yeah, that's not on the skilled occupations list. So that means you won't be able to apply for a skilled visa or an employee's sponsored visa to stay permanently in Australia. So mm -hmm. what I see a lot is you come out and after eight months you go, I love Australia, I want to live here and stay, and then you're going to be stuck. So have a look at maybe getting that PGCE. You've still got a couple of years. If you're only 29, it takes 12 months to get it. Once you've got that qualification, then that opens up all the permanent residency avenues that you'll probably want later on down the track. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Right. The only other option would be to then get a student visa in Australia and study here. However, it would be quite expensive for you to okay. do a, um, the degree. We don't have a one year teaching qualification anymore. The only option is doing a master of teaching, which is if you do secondary, you can do it in a year and a half or otherwise it's two years. Um, okay. And the, the year and a half course is pretty intense. It's the accelerated mo mode. Um, but yeah, it, it'd be quite pricey. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, I'm, you're welcome. I'm going to leave. I have to go to work. Oh, but thank no you worries. very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Have a lovely, I don't know, afternoon probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye. Have you thought of any other questions, Fiona, or uh no i'm just in the process of sending my cv through to you darren um and then i will do the free check the not the points calculation thing sorry i'm tired i've had a long night i've only just got in from work so uh, sure no worries fiona <laughs> um, so yeah i'll send that through and then we'll go from there i guess yeah all right great stuff i look forward to receiving it and i'll get straight back to you Thanks. Okay, I'll go then. Have a good evening and um, talk Thank to you, you soon. Right. Thanks, Bye. Fiona. Thanks, Fiona. Bye. Bye. Any final thoughts from you, Darren, for anyone watching the recording? Um, I don't know. I'd probably just like to, uh, to say again, you know, if you're looking to come to Australia, now's a good time. Um, the borders are, are open. Uh, the state governments are opening up. Uh, all the temporary visas now, uh, you, you don't need a travel exemption. You can come straight out on, on most of those. 
skilled visas are being processed. So, yeah, if you're looking to come to Australia, um, don't hang around. Get your uh, expression of interest in and, and jump in the queue. That's really all I'd like to say is to reiterate that. So, yeah. And if you have any questions or, or want a free assessment, just drop me an email or go on our website and do the free points calculator and, and we'll let you know um, whether you're eligible or not and, and what we can do to help you if you're not eligible. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, if anyone watching is looking to get in contact with ANZ UK about teaching opportunities um, or teaching assistant work, uh, you can scan the QR code and fill out an expression of interest form. Um, it's not like the government one, it's much simpler and you don't have to pay anything um, to, to get yourself ready. Um, so uh, yeah, you can just fill out the form and we can get in contact with you about your plans. Well, thanks for tuning in everyone. It's been a pleasure. And um, if you do have any additional questions, um, you can reach out to Visa Go Australia or ANZ UK, depending on what the nature of your question is. And um, we're more than happy to assist you. Excellent. Thanks everyone for uh, attending and watching this um, webinar. <laughs>